How's, uh, how's day one of Town Connect Sydney going for everyone? Yeah. We, come on, we can do better than that. <laughs> Very excited to close day one, obviously before the, the big party this afternoon or this evening with all of you to dig into outside the sourcing box. So the idea here is that you know, many of you are using LinkedIn, recruiter, talent branding, different products. And you know, as a LinkedIn employee, I'm very excited about that because obviously that means we're really transforming the industry. But at the end of the day, if you're all using the same products, you've got to figure out how you can get that differentiation. And so for all of you who saw a Netherton this morning from Rapid7, he talked about you know, how they were using the same kind of tools, but using them a lot more effectively and using, you know, innovating in different ways. And so the goal of today's session is to really walk through how three rock star folks are using sourcing and branding and different pieces of data and different pieces of recruiting more effectively. So quick intro to me, my name is James Raybold. I head up marketing for LinkedIn Talent Solutions. And I've been at LinkedIn for about four years plus. Love LinkedIn. I, I wear a LinkedIn t-shirt every day, LinkedIn t-shirt every day. So I figured today I could kind of dress up and wear, wear a suit for all of you or I could just wear a LinkedIn t-shirt every day. So I, I decided to go with being, uh, being honest. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna have each person introduce themselves and then do one thing not in the LinkedIn profile. And for me, that is that I'm very lucky that today I am in my favorite city in the whole world. So I grew up in the UK, so I kind of, I like Australia, I like Sydney because I a little bit of UK. Now I live in the US and so I like the US and there's also a lot of Australia that's different. So I'm, I'm very thankful to all of you for giving me the opportunity to basically have an all expenses paid trip to Sydney, my favorite place <laughs> in the whole world, to come and you know, have some fun on stage at the end of, of day one. So uh, thank you for that. With that, I will hand over and we'll, we'll walk along. Oh. Hello, uh, my name is Beck Jones. Uh, I work for Atlassian. Um, I joined Atlassian in December last year, so I'm relatively new to the company and I'm utterly obsessed. Um, so I'm excited to talk to you about my journey with Atlassian so far today. Um, my role is twofold. I head up uh, global grad recruitment and also uh, global campaigns. So I support the experienced hire team with sourcing and with also volume campaigns. Um, we have a huge, like we're scaling like crazy. We have a huge number of roles. Um, so I was brought on board to really help the team, uh, you know, get some volume through the door. Oh, one thing about me, um, so I'm fashion obsessed and uh, to justify that I started a fashion blog um, with actually one of my friends who's in the audience today. Um, so yeah, I feel less guilty now about the spending. What's the name? You've got a whole audience here. Some... It's actually um, about uh, work fashion, it's called That Look Works. That Look Works, right. Check it out. Giving you <laughs> Very good. Hi everyone, my name's Dowd. I look after the strategic sourcing function at Lion. Uh, who are Lion? You would probably have heard of Lion Nathan or National Foods, and they merged to form Lion. Uh, in my fridge, there's about 80% of the products are Lion made from the dairy farmer's milk to dare iced coffee um, through to the Yople yogurt, and uh, well, maybe I'm a little bit embarrassed to say about 50% of the fridge is dedicated to our beers, spirits, and wines portfolio. <laughs> I'm particularly uh, fond of some of our craft beers. Uh, at the James Squires range, for example, um, is something that I particularly enjoy. So um, that's not the one thing that isn't on my LinkedIn profile. Uh, the one thing that isn't on my LinkedIn profile is I'm a complete comic geek. Uh, and well, actually my family would probably drop the comic bit out of that title. Um, so uh, I was um, you know, listening to Ed Nathanson earlier on today. I was particularly jealous of his uh, Superman socks. <laughs> Great. Hi, guys. Great to be here today. Um, I nearly didn't make it. The guys downstairs uh, like wanted to ID me to make sure I was over 18 uh, to come upstairs. <laughs> Uh, then I came up the next escalators and I met a lovely lady from um, the University of New South Wales recruitment team and then we got asked if we were auditioning for X Factor. Um, <laughs> I pretty much said uh, talent connect but not that talent. You know? <laughs> and so ultimately I've actually made it up here now which is great. So um, my name's Emma Pilcher. I am from a healthcare company in Sydney um, called King Care. You may not have heard of us yet because you may not have had a requirement to uh, look at care options for your parents or you may have had to or your grandparents. Um, our company is a medium-sized organ organisation. We've moved from being a small family-owned company into a very fast-growing organisation that's 
um, experience experiencing probably 60 to 70 percent year on year growth. Uh, so you can imagine our town acquisition strategies are, are quite aggressive at the moment. Um, in my role as HR manager, I am responsible for all the talent acquisition and everything that comes with a challenging role as HR manager. Um, the, the thing on my LinkedIn profile that probably people wouldn't know about me is that I have an um, extraordinarily good ability to be able to catch with my left hand, and I am right-handed. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have our little Will, William Tell moment here. So, uh, so I've got to be ready. So. <laughs> Do I need to move? How, how, how hard There's a whole bunch ready, of glasses behind her there. How hard can I throw the apple? <laughs> Barry? Okay, you ready? All right, you ready? Oh! oh. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Guys, my name is Hamie Code and I'm a product consultant at LinkedIn. I've been with LinkedIn now for just on three years and this is, I'm glad to say, my third Talent Connect in Sydney, so it's been amazing to see how it grows. I'm also a blogger, like Beck, but I blog about brunch, but that is on my LinkedIn profile. Dan <laughs> mentioned that the rich content module went live. I was in on that thing. I was like, here's photos of food. So now my photos of food don't just spam my friend's Facebook feed, they're also spamming LinkedIn. You can thank me later. <laughs> Coffee shots. Um, the thing that's not on my LinkedIn profile that might surprise you is that I did nine years of Russian ballet as a child. Wow. So as a result, I have really good posture, um, but not necessarily the body of a dancer. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. I've got to get something out of it. <laughs> well, guys, I'm really excited to bring these awesome, awesome sources stories to you today. And I thought what might be really good for us is to think about those things that we always want to do but don't always have the time to do or the resources to do or we kind of think it's maybe a little bit out of our reach. I know that most of us were really inspired by Ed Nathanson this morning with Rapid7 and sometimes we think, well, that's great, you're a tech company. You know, you've got a lot more flexibility. So I'm excited to bring these stories because Emma can tell you she's definitely not in tech. Um, aged healthcare service is a little bit different. Um, Very different. But I thought, based on the brand sessions being just before now in the last session, let's start with brand. Um, not many recruiters consider brand to be part of their remit. So I'm really interested, and we might start with you, Dowd. How has your recruitment team used brand creatively when they're sourcing talent that you maybe didn't previously have access to? So I think that um, I think that brand actually, or, or at least the employee brand, should fall directly within the mandate of the resourcing function, the recruiters. Um, I'm sort of firmly on the side of the ledger of Jeff, your CEO, when he said that the, the the future best recruiters of the world are thinking more and more like the best marketers. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if we if we connect with people in a really genuine way, marketers know how to do that. They know that the connections happen at, uh, at an emotional level. And we've, so we've been really serious about the way that we want to connect with our audiences. Um, and I think that uh, we, we, we articulate that in our employee value proposition. We've been very resolute about what that means. We've built an organization based on cultural values. We, we want people to be the best that they can be. We want them to really make a difference. And we want them to have a great time doing it too. Mm -hmm. And referring back to something that Ed uh, spoke about earlier on today, the golden circle model from Simon Sinek, it's the what and the how and the why. Mm -hmm. And when you can connect with people at the why, why are they actually doing something? Why would they want to belong to an organization? That's where genuine connections happen. So how have we done that at Lion? Well, we've, we've created um, I guess a, a library of authentic stories from people within our organization that bring that, those values, that bring that brand to life. And we, we, we have a number of modes, a number of mediums, whether it be infographics, um, video. Like the Queen video from Ed Nathan's not this quite, morning, not, no? Not quite no as, as slick as that, but, <laughs> okay. but uh, yeah, some, some good videos. Uh, and yeah, we, we um, ask our recruiters to share those stories externally. We also encourage our leaders to be more visible both internally and externally. So some of them are writing blogs. Um, some of them are being more active in external communities. Uh, and I think understanding that 
primary brand position and promoting that in a way that's really meaningful mm -hmm. is critical to getting engagement with an external market. Okay, awesome. And Beck, I know at Atlassian, you guys have got some pretty cool stuff going on with your brand, and I'm particularly intrigued by your values. <laughs> now, you work in graduate recruitment as yeah. part of your role, and I'm curious for you, A, to tell us a little bit about your values that form part of your value prop, but how does that translate to grads? So, um, yeah, so our values are very interesting, a little bit controversial, and how they came about was about six years ago. Um, Scott and Mike, our two founders, really wanted to, um, you know, they didn't, they didn't believe in, I guess, bullshit values, so they wanted to put out their values that they really stood by. Um, so the firm came together, the organisation came together, and they basically came up with five key values. Um, they're controversial because they swear, and uh, I came from nine years in professional services, so you can imagine um, it freaks me out to even I'm going to say this on stage. <laughs> but um, the two of the cool values are um, open company, no bullshit, and also don't fuck the customer. So um, <laughs> I can safely say I won't get fired by saying the F-bomb, um, but it, it is kind of a bit like, wow. And I guess when I go to campus and I talk to students, about that, you know, the, we are so open and we are so out there that it really connects with the student community. Um, we do some other cool stuff, I guess, with the brand. We are pretty out there, and as a result, I have kind of free reign, which is pretty cool in terms of how we recruit. Um, one thing we did recently, which was really awesome with the brand, was we, we do a lot of campaigns and road shows. So Atlassian has and does make really awesome pro software products. So we're lucky that you know we, we can engage a wide audience who aren't necessarily interested in recruitment opportunities, but they love to hear the Atlassian story. So recently, I did a New Zealand campaign, and initially it was just to recruit grads. So I I had a really um, good gut feel that that's where talent was for Atlassian. So I did a two-week campaign and I thought at the same time as recruiting grads, I may as well tap into the Experience High Network or Professional Network as well. Um, so as a result, after we did five cities, five universities, I did 20 grad interviews um, and we did five Experience High Networking events. Uh, we, we met individually about 300 people in terms of having a conversation about Atlassian um, and I came back with 10 grad hires, which was pretty cool. Wow. So um, yeah, it was awesome and, and I'm so lucky that I have that opportunity and obviously uh, not every company has that, but um, you know, Atlassian brand allows us to do those sorts of really cool things um, and allows us to have global reach in terms of accessing talent too. Beck, can I ask, what do you think had more impact? Those kind of scalable activities that you were doing in the roadshow format or do you think there was that one-to-one that -one conversation that really kind of made more of an impact? What do you think? Um, I think the big bang thing with the campaign is good initially in the sense of like we had never gone to New Zealand before, we've never tapped into the NZ market, so the big bang is necessary to say like, hey, we're at last year and we exist. Mm -hmm. um, but then like I have this thing about keeping people warm, I'm like, you need to hug them tight. Um, <laughs> and so that's like the next step for me. So we went over there, we have like a lot of um, targeted tech talks, so we actually like help to people understand how they could better use Atlassian products, so it's not like recruitment in your face. Um, and you know, from there we do the follow-ups and we'll have about, uh, as a result, we've got about 30 candidates we're talking to for experience hire opportunities. Do you find that, Ed this morning discussed, you know, they have a very particular culture which means some people love it, some people hate it. Do you find having edgier values than maybe most companies have means that some people hate it and they're just the wrong people for your company? Or? Yeah, I think we, we pretty much say this is how we are. Um, you either like it or you don't like it. Um, we're very open through the process and in fact that's one of the reasons that I was drawn to it last is because the process is, and the recruitment process and what we spoke out is so open. And often values are kind of put out there and everyone goes, oh yeah, that's a value and you don't actually live by it. But literally every day I see our values in action. So. A, a cool example is um, day one, I started to put some stuff together for the strategy over the next five years and within a couple of minutes people were commenting on my strategy page from all around the company and it's just that whole open company thing like it lives and breathes at, you know, in Atlassian. So. And, and so are you the candidate? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> That's not part of the services I provide. <laughs> That, that, that could be a HR violation right yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for saying that to me. Um, could, we're not going to cover that as a sourcing method either. Um, <laughs> some, some people use the flirt to convert strategy. We might not go down that path today. But if we think about sourcing, we talk a lot about sourcing at LinkedIn. You know, we're always talking about finding the right candidate. And brand we know is filling the kind of the top of that funnel. And then we need to filter through and really source within that assess, uh, accessible market. Um, one thing we don't, in my experience, talk about enough is sourcing habits. 
So Emma, I'm really curious to find out from your guys at KinCare, what are some things that your sourcing team have done and embedded kind of into the DNA of what is KinCare sourcing to kind of get you access to people you didn't have access to before? Mm, great question. Um, I think that basically with regards to where our market is at the moment, um, our brand is fairly immature compared to, um, you know, should I say, the two brands that are obviously represented next to me here. We're in the middle of trying to design our culture. We're trying to go through a culture transformation and come up with these signature behaviours that represent what our organisation is about. So we don't have a solid platform to go out to the market and say, hey, we're so amazing, um, come to our industry. And and um, should I say, by, by way of what we do, it's not particularly known as an attractive industry, the space that we work in, but we're trying Why to not? make it exciting. Um, should I say aged care is, uh, you know, you put it next to fashion, media, you know, communications. People are always going to look at the professional services or finance or something that's great in the city. Whereas the opportunities and the growth and the potential for people to have such uh, large scale in their jobs is available within the sector that I operate in at the moment. Mm -hmm. So we've had to really leverage off that and go back to basics and say, okay, we put our hands up. We can't do this all and we can't attract all the people that we want at the moment. But what ways are we going to go about it to make sure that moving into the future, we are creating that very um, lucrative space for people to have a career mm -hmm. in this space in healthcare. So um, coming back to essentially what we're trying to do at the moment is that we, we said, all right, we're going to go out to our line managers and we're going to go back to basics and we're going to talk to them about the actual 101, about how to run a proper recruitment process and really understand what it means to put the time in, not be scared of hiring people that are better than you or who are going to complement your teams and really teach them actually about how to run the pro process properly and introduce all the, all the bits and pieces that come along with it, the social side. Um, but not only that, we, re we obviously noticed that we are not major players in what we do at the moment, but we want to be. So we actually do engage external consultants who come into our organisation. So we do go out to the likes of PwC, we do engage cultural organisations, we do have um, places come in and say, okay, we've got great projects, we want you to come in and work with us. And the talent strategy that we put behind that, instead of going straight to market and trying to attract a candidate to our process, we get those people in from external organisations. And this might be a little bit controversial, but we get them into our business and we show them the potential with our organisation and we show them where we want to go. Mm. And it's simply about having the conversation with them once they're in there and they've been engaged yeah. with us from a consultancy perspective. And I know, Emma, that we were talking earlier um, a couple of weeks ago about a senior hire that you made and, and part of your challenge to get access to candidates that might already be in professional services or something is to actually educate them on why your industry is the industry of the future. And so how did you go about getting this particular senior hire that you mentioned to me the other day kind of into the recruitment process? Mm, great question. Um, so essentially, I went out with the facts and I went out with the statistics. I said, our organisation is going to be the biggest employment group in Australia in the next five years. We are going to have the most opportunities, the most exciting things to do within the health space. Old. Yes, and we have an ageing population. So let's look, we saw the stats this morning on that scale that I think Angela put up. And um, it's phenomenal what needs to happen within our space. There's 75% growth that's going to happen alone within the aged care space. So that's a lot of talent that's required for our business and within our remit. So we really need to be going out to those people now and saying, there is an attractive job opportunity for you here. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. And Dowd, I know at Lion you were brought on into a strategic sourcing function specifically. Why did you guys look to change some of the structure around your team to change the way you're doing sourcing? Yeah, right. Um, that's, a, that's a big question. Um, I just kind of how much time have I got? <laughs> uh, I think um, something that Ed was talking about earlier is the uh, uh, creating the structure that allows you to be a specialist in your space. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a discipline focus, whether it's a functional focus, I think that's, that's the sort of structure that you need to create to, to, to give the recruiters the opportunity to become centers of excellence. Mm -hmm. So that was really the thinking behind the new model. Um, it, also, it, it also sort of uh, broke down the, the sourcing activities into two key areas, the tactical delivery of results and the strategic um, thinking around how do we grow our presence how do we grow our recruiters' profiles? How do we come to become talent magnets? Mm -hmm. 
So I think having that dual lens uh, really helped to deliver greater co connectivity with the audiences that we wanted to speak to. Mm -hmm. um, I think, yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. And I, if you think about any of the big changes that you guys have made with kind of splitting your function to have those specialist areas, what was the biggest impact to the recruitment team? I think having the, um, the opportunity to really grow the brand mm -hmm. and really converse with their audiences using messages that were relevant to those audiences. Mm -hmm. That was probably the biggest change. Things that we did, for example, we created networking events, we built pipelines that we then invited into uh, beer and food matching events so they could meet our, so our, some of our leaders. my food gets matched with my beer, like my <coughs> wine at degustation kind of thing? Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and you know, in, in the same way that Ed was talking about earlier, you know, that's an opportunity for some people to filter out, mm -hmm. and that's fine. But those that want to come along are more connected to you know, the why that we exist. And then when it comes to having a requirement in those talent pools that typically would be in short supply, we were already connected to those people. Mm -hmm. They were already engaged in our story. Uh, so obviously that had knock-on effects with time to fill, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. And I know that whenever we talk about LinkedIn and sourcing, everybody likes to talk about data. Um, I love working for LinkedIn based on the pure fact that there is so much data at my fingertips. I don't recruit every day anymore, but I, I think about, I don't know what I would do if I didn't have a recruiter license, even though I'm not recruiting every day, because I still have, I'm a little bit nosy, if I'm honest, <laughs> I just kind of like the data. Um, but one of the things that I love talking about is kind of that secret source that LinkedIn has and how organizations can take the data that LinkedIn has and the intelligence that's there on our network and actually practically implement something with that into the sourcing because it's beyond just finding somebody to fill a role. It's actually leveraging the, the bigger picture. Do any of you guys have an example of how you guys are using data effectively within sourcing, either from LinkedIn or somewhere else? Um, I do. So we kind of have a two-pronged strategy about how we're using it at the moment. So with our business, 85% of our employees are actually field employees. So we don't see them on a day-to-day -day basis. They're actually out and about in the communities. They're nurses, they're physios, they're occupational therapists, home care workers. So we need to connect with them at the right time. So um, looking at the analytics, it's not wise for us to send them content messages or should I say try and promote to them and push notifications to them at eight o'clock or nine o'clock on a Monday morning. We know that they're driving to a job or they're working you know, with one of our competitors. Um, they're not gonna take notice of, of, of our strategy. So we've noticed the best time for us to contact them are between four and uh, 6.30 at night. So our messages are aimed at that time with regards to advertising and what we do. Um, on the other side of that, the demographic of most of the people that we're trying to target are middle-aged women. So a lot of our hires are within that space between 35 to 65 year olds. Mm -hmm. And as we all know, they're the largest adopter group of social media at the moment. So our strategy needs to be very much in line with what those growth patterns are and it works for us. Our response rate from what we've looked at has significantly gone up with regards to um, the Google Analytics that we look at and the responses at the time of day messaging. So I think that's a really important point to look at. So you basically started experimenting and then over time honed in on the right times. How many people in the audience right now are kind of analyzing the time of day that when to use LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook for messaging? A few, not too many. So again, I think that's something that, again, depending on the audiences you guys are recruiting for, there could absolutely be the same dynamic where people aren't actually on that regular clock and therefore reaching them before or maybe at lunch or after work can be incredibly useful. And Emma, you mentioned the, the demographic you're after. I'm assuming time of day is one element. Then there's also an element of getting the content right and the type of messages you're sending out. What kind of trial and error have you guys had with that? I'm imagining it would have to be a similar process of trying it and seeing if it works. Absolutely. Anything with a picture obviously gets more likes. Okay. Or anything with something that's quite funny or something that's going to connect back to their passion. We've heard the word passion thrown around a lot today. Um, and a lot of our strategy to attract our talent is based around passion. So we really try and connect it with something that they're going to feel good about mm -hmm. or that intrinsically they're going to want to look at that's not primarily associated just with work. Mm -hmm. um, so graphics have worked really well for us or something that is simple, easy to read and they can consume the media fast. Okay. Are you guys conscious too of mobile content versus 
desktop? Very much so. So we're just currently designing a new website at the moment, and we're very conscious of making sure that it's tablet ready, that it's mobile ready, and that our, our we've actually designed an app so our staff actually log on, log off through the app so we can send them push notifications through the day or depending on the time of day that we want to, uh, should I say, attract people um, through this app called My King Care. So it's pretty, it's pretty great technology for us at the moment. Um, we are in phase one of it, but from what we can see, it's working. And um, our followers to our LinkedIn page, should I say, are increasing daily. <laughs> Yeah, and it's exciting to hear organisations building out mobile technology for recruitment. You know, hearing about apps like that. Does, can I get a show of hands? Has anyone else's company got an app that focuses on recruitment or sourcing? Anyone? Oh yeah, one up the back. Excellent. It's um, it's definitely some some of the new stuff I've seen. I've seen a couple of apps coming out of New Zealand with New Zealand um, banks in particular. ASB has got an augmented reality app where you can kind of put your put your phone up at one of their buildings and then a little guy kind of comes up and talks to you about working at ASB. It's, it's kind of really cool. If you haven't checked it out, you should. They'll love the plugs on that, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but it's interesting. Dowd, what about at Lion? Um, strategic sourcing implies data. Mm. <coughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> what, what I, think, um, I think there's sort of an art and a science to, to, to recruitment and, and the art is in the way that we connect with people. It's the human interactions. Mm -hmm. uh, the science is in the data. Uh, and um, Abraham Lincoln was famous for saying, if, I, if I'm going to uh, give myself six hours to chop down a tree, I'm going to spend the first four hours sharpening my axe. And I think that's the way that we want to look at data. Mm -hmm. It should inform our sourcing strategies. But it's sort of like the $64 million question, really, because you know, it can be your best friend and it can probably be your worst enemy. You sort of, you know, it's, um, I sometimes feel like we're, we're drowning in data and starved of wisdom. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, some of the things that we've done on, on a pragmatic basis, you know, day to day to help us with our sourcing strategies and, and allowing the data to inform us, mm -hmm. um, specifically with LinkedIn, for example. If we, if we know there's a profile of an individual that's right for this particular job, they might be in that job at the moment. Um, they could be somebody that's done the role previously in our organization or even somebody that we've sort of identified uh, in our company but that just isn't right for the move, maybe the location is wrong, then we can plug that profile into LinkedIn. And as Dan Shapiro showed us earlier, you've got similar profiles. So boom, there's your shortlist. Mm -hmm. um, other things that we've done, we've, you know, fish where the fish are is, is, is a common phrase in marketing. So looking at the talent flows, mm -hmm. where are we getting good talent from and going back out to those markets? Uh, other things that we've done, being a little bit more drilling down into the data. Mm -hmm. in, there, there's been a couple of examples where we found it really hard to, to recruit in particular locations. Mm -hmm. Now, it could be that it's the location that's challenging, or it could be that the skill set within that location just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So what we've done is we've plugged into LinkedIn the job titles that we want, the industry background that we're looking for, the number of years experience that we want, um, and done a global search, but then we've refined that so that we're looking at people who have gone to university mm -hmm. in that place that we're looking to, to recruit in. So Tasmania, Hobart, for example, or Melbourne. Uh, and that allows us to then have a really good conversation with those people. We know they're going to be right in terms yeah. of the skill set and the industry, and we can talk to them about the fact that they went to university at this place. Maybe so that's worked really well for us. Maybe relocation expense as well if they want to move back home to the family. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Beck, I know that you guys recruit globally as well. You mentioned you've got stuff going on in New Zealand. I know that Vietnam, the US. Are you guys looking to the data to help you figure out where to recruit, where to open offices, where should we put our software engineers? Yeah, def absolutely. Um, like right through from grad through to uh, experience highs, we use the data to have a look at what geos are kind of hot for tech talent. Um, an example is I have, uh, we've done, been doing a lot of research into kind of where's the next hotspot and I have a really good feeling about Scandinavia and later in the year I'll probably go over and do a campaign there. So right now I'm just having put the data in terms Hang of on, where. Is that, is that one of those free trips like James was talking about before? <laughs> <laughs> I work a lot as well. <laughs> um, just but, checking, yeah. just checking. European getaway. Um, so uh, we use the data I guess to have a look at yeah, where people are at, where are they coming from, um, like 
like you know what's happening in the startup tech community and then for grads I have a look at it's really hard to get any solid information about graduates coming out of university in terms of what they're studying where they sit what are the top feeder universities so I use the you know data in all that and I remember my first meeting with Scott and Mike our founders and um, they were so hungry for data they have not it's have not really been traditionally used through the process so far and it's kind of we've kind of gone out on a limb sometimes without having anything to back up what we're thinking so I'm very conscious of any campaigns I'm doing now to provide them with data and um, you know help them understand you know where, where I guess we can access talent from. Okay. Are there other data sources apart from LinkedIn that you're leveraging as well that we might not have heard of? I know tech often is you know a couple of steps ahead. Yeah. Um, look, there's a whole heap of things. So we're really active on blogs, online forums. Like Quora is a really cool source of um, information. Um, I follow a heap of tech blogs. Um, I access like information from universities. Um, I kind of, whatever I can do, I try and access it. Um, a few weeks ago, uh, when I first started, I, you know, to be honest, our team is not really awesome at sourcing. I don't think we're doing anything crazily out of the box at the moment. Um, so when I came on board, I was like, okay, look, what can we do to challenge ourselves and dedicate some time to strategic sourcing? So we came up with a 12 months of sourcing challenge where every month we dedicate time to a particular sourcing methodology or something cool in terms of sourcing. So the first one was Twitter. Um, and as an example, we don't really have any social media in terms of promoting Atlassian culture or opportunities. So we set up an Atlassian talent Twitter handle and within one week we had 150 followers. Um, and right now, after a month, we're at sitting at 300 followers. Um, and it's not heaps, but that's still 300 people who are now hearing about us. Um, so, uh, yeah, as I said, we're, we're trying a lot of different things. We're trying a lot of strategic sourcing, uh, sorry, a lot of uh, social sourcing as mm -hmm. well as um, traditional things like LinkedIn. It sounds, it sounds like it's really about taking that leap, an intelligent risk with some data to help you kind of check that gut feeling. We talk about that gut feeling a lot in recruitment. Um, we want to open up for questions for these guys because you guys probably have some questions for the team. But before that, if you guys could give one piece of advice, you know, something that really resonates with you around trying to be innovative and be creative about sourcing in your business, what would you leave the group with today? Anyone can start. Um, so my thing is dream big and it sounds kind of, yeah, yeah, but I'm, I'm totally about swing big. And every day uh, Scott and Mike tell me and, and my head of talent tells me to like, aim big and aim high um, and everything I do now I think am I thinking like as possibly outside of the box as I can and always challenging myself to think about is this a really wild idea and if it is then I'm like yeah I'm on the money so yeah awesome I'd probably follow that up by saying <clears throat> and take small steps every day um, I think if you ask most people what makes them successful in any field whether it's in their career or in a relationship or financially it's, it's, it's not often one big thing that they did. They probably dreamt big, but it's the little things that they do every day that makes the difference. And I think it's that consistency um, and commitment to taking some action. You know, we sort of live in this information age at the moment, and I, 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 I sort of feel like there's a bit of a myth around information, that information is power. And I mean, it's not really power, it's potential power. But the real value gets created out of action. So that would probably be my, my one takeaway. Awesome. Mm. <clears throat> um, what I'd probably say is that I think that we need to not make it too hard. We need to focus on being unique, obviously. Mm -hmm. But I think also just keeping it really basic. You know, everybody knows where they need to go with their strategic plan or what is their ideal person for what they're trying to get the, you know, should I say the pinnacle of where they're going with their goal for the business. So. If you're hearing about people on the bus, at the gym, um, while you're walking, at restaurants, and you're hearing about them talk about opportunities that they're looking for, or what work they do, or just having conversations, ask them, mm -hmm. put it out there. I, I put it out there so much and say, look, you'd be great for our company, um, you know, six months from now, we're planning to do this with our strategic plan, here's my card, or look me up on LinkedIn, would you be interested? So. Even when I'm not working, I'm still thinking about it. So I think that's a really kind of strategic way to look at it and, and just be open to having that discussion. Put it out there. It, it feels almost like that back to basics thing is, is the retro version of what's back in fashion again. You know, stonewash <laughs> denim, it's back. It sounds like, you know, <laughs> dreaming big, we've heard about it before, but how many of us actually do it? Taking a step towards that dream every day, how many of us do it? And then we're recruiters, right? We have conversations and we build relationships. Yeah. How many of us are doing that instead of just being online? 
Um, guys, thank you for your time. Before we clap you, um, I wanted to open up for questions. So have we got any questions from the audience that you're dying to find out? We've got some microphones that will run around. Put your hand up or stand up, it might be easier. Um, so this quick, oh. mm. can everybody hear me? Oh, good. Um, so this question is for, I guess, any or all of you. Um, I'm sure that in each of your industries, you have you know, spots that are notoriously hard to fill or um, you know, real pressure points. How, do you have any tips for you know, thinking outside the square and, and managing those pressure points? Um, yeah, sure. So I think uh, starting off by giving recruiters areas that they can specialise in, that will, that will over time deliver the kind of pipelines that Ed uh, Nathanson was talking about earlier. I think also using the data, you know, taking the time to sharpen your axe. Um, I think also you know, trying, to, trying to consider what are the multiple channels that you would use. So for example, you know, it's not just about raising a flag and putting a job advert out there, what, what are the networking events that you could attend? Who are the professional associations or the bodies that you could leverage? Um, what, where, where in the world are these skills um, in higher uh, supply that you could perhaps tap into? Um, so looking at, as I say, talent flows, uh, doing, doing some interesting Boolean searches, not necessarily just on LinkedIn, but uh, you know, across Google as well will help you in, in finding some where, where some of that hidden talent lies. The only uh, other thing I'd add there as well is um, tapping into the, our, our internal networks. So I know that people in Atlassian know other people and know where the talent is. So I literally sometimes sit down and I'm like, tell me five people and where are they? <laughs> and even if those five people don't lead to anything, I have a feel for where they might be or what companies they're at and kind of you can pick up some trends as well about where some of that hard to fill talent sits. So um, yeah, I, I like, agree totally completely. agree with everything, yeah. but um, I think we probably don't access as much internal knowledge as, as we do, as, as we can. Mm. I'd follow that and um, actually take it even a little bit further that it is employees' jobs, not just HR, not just people in culture, not just strategic sourcing teams to essentially attract talent to the business. It's every single employee in that company needs to be a brand ambassador. So we kind of uh, really try to push it out to our staff and say, okay, guys, we need to get here by this time and we need your help because we're not going to be able to get there just by doing it ourselves. Put it out there and you will be rewarded through this program that we're going to set up X, Y, Z. So we really try and make it a company-wide initiative to find what we need to do to achieve our goals. Guys, okay. any other questions out there? Can't see. No? <laughs> All right, cool. Well, guys, it is party time. So let's give these guys a round of applause before we head off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, there is nothing much left to tell you other than to follow the massive crowd that is heading to Dalton House. In case you don't know where it is, it's over the road across from the casino under the Accenture building. You'll find it. Just follow everybody else who's moving towards the bar, basically. And thanks for being with us. Thank you.